can start recording. Thank you very much. And it's my great pleasure to introduce you all to Xiaomin Xie. She is coming to us uh, uh, from Cornell's ORIE department, where she's currently a visiting assistant professor. Um, she has spent time as a postdoc at MIT and as a research fellow at the Simons Institute, a place I know uh, many of us love. Um, she received her PhD degree from uh, University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. Um, her research interests are in applied probability, but uh, of, of uh, special interest, I think, to a lot of the people in this group is some of her recent work in reinforcement learning and stochastic networks. Uh, she's won multiple awards, including uh, a Google Systems Research Award, and she's going to talk to us today about uh, the power of Monte Carlo methods. So please take it away, Chiaomin. Uh, thank you, Jeff, for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's my great pleasure to speak here today. Uh, I really hope that I could visit the Wisconsin uh, someday in the near future in person. Uh, today, I will talk about my recent work on understanding and applying Monte Carlo methods in reinforcement learning. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions during the talk. Uh, let me start with uh, motivating applications. One critical societal infrastructure is the data networks, which enable the global communication. And these networks transform our life in many, many ways, including the business, the entertainment, and the relationship. For instance, uh, today's data centers power many services and applications. And having access to these services become an important part of our daily life and work. And this is particularly the case since the pandemic with a lot of activities moving online. Uh, for example, the, we lost the lease services. I'm not be able to deliver the assignment, uh, seminar today. We know data centers have a lot of servers and a huge storage system for keeping massive among the data and also a large network for communication both within the network and outside with the internet. And these applications share the underlying resources. A fundamental question here is how to allocate these resources for different applications and also different jobs from the same application. Just for a simple example, uh, when you type a query on Amazon, uh, the request will send to one of the data center uh, that Amazon have, and the system needs to decide which server to process your request. And then it will try to return the query results to you uh, quickly. And imagine that there are many, many other people sending the query at the same time to the data centers. And how to do the routing and the scheduling is an importance for providing high quality services. And as customers, we are usually impatient they're waiting still for the response. So efficient uh, resource allocation here has a huge impact on customer satisfaction and also the company's revenue. The scheduling and the resource allocation problem is common and critical, not just for the data networks, but also in many other applications including transportation network, healthcare, inventory control, and so on. And in all these applications, we want to design efficient algorithms and provide rigorous characterization of their performance in terms of throughput, the delay revenue, or, may, or maybe other metric you are interested. And driven by these applications, my research uh, involves two different but complementary approaches, the model-driven approach and the data-driven approach. Now, let me illustrate what these two approaches are. For the model-driven approach, uh, the typical design flow is the follows. We start with accurate modeling of the system, such as queuing network for the scheduling problem. 
And then based on our intuition or domain knowledge, we'll design algorithms for our problem. And we might run simulations or experiments to test and tune the algorithm for better performance. And then we uh, prove the performance guarantees. Uh, most existing research on resource allocation problems are mainly based on uh, the model-driven approach. And there is a rich literature on this line of work. And actually, uh, many audience here have important contribution to this line. And it has significantly deepened our understanding of the scheduling theory. It is also well recognized that there are many challenges here. First, the underlying system might be too complicated and an accurate model might not be available. And secondary, even if we have accurate the model, optimal policies are difficult to find. And this is true even for some simple models. These issues are very challenging, but today there are new opportunities of addressing these issues by taking advantage of the availability of simulator or maybe find grain data sets that record the system's behavior and the trajectories. The data-driven approach, uh, particularly based on reinforcement learning, has the potential of tackling these challenges here. It can learn system dynamics from the data. And also it can discover new policies from interacting with the system. As I mentioned, uh, my research uh, spans the both approaches. Uh, in particular, my earlier work mainly focused on the model-driven approach and lied in the area of stochastic systems, queuing theory, and applied probability. Uh, my more recent work explores the potential and the power of the data-driven approach uh, using techniques from reinforcement learning, statistical analysis, and the game theory. Today, uh, I will mainly focus on my work on data-driven approach and uh, reinforcement learning. We know uh, reinforcement learning is about the study of sequential decision making. Uh, where an agent interacts with an environment and to gain the long-term reward. And in the past few years, it's achieved remarkable empirical success in some applications, including games and robotics. However, it is also well recognized that uh, existing reinforcement learning techniques are in, uh, insufficient in dealing with the many of the complexities that arrive in real world applications. Uh, these include large staged action space, uh, time vary environments, uh, maybe even strategic agents uh, and so on. And these issues are common in many of the applications that I mentioned earlier. And they have motivated me to develop new IR techniques to addressing these issues. And with the goal of building a solid foundation of reinforcement learning for real world applications. Uh, in today's talk, uh, I will mainly focus on one line of my work that's the studies the Monte Carlo methods for problems with unbounded state space and how to achieve stability in these problems. This talk is based on a few papers uh, with my excellent collaborators. And let me start with the standard framework for reinforcement learning or the Marco decision processes. We know in an MDP, an agent or the so-called decision maker interacts with the environment as follows. At each time step, the agents uh, observe the state of the environment and take some action and receives the reward as the feedback and the environments to make a transition to new state. And the interaction will repeat and continues. A policy for agents 
maps each state to a distribution of actions. It's basically specified the probability of taking a particular action given the constant state. And the goal of the agents here is to find a policy that's to maximize the expected the total discounted reward. Here, gamma is a discounted factor between zero and one. When the model uh, is unknown, then it becomes a reinforcement learning problem. The agents now want to learn a good policy from the interaction data. It can be real experience data or can be simulated data. We know in an MDP, it is well known that the value functions can be defined in two different ways. Uh, that's fixed a policy and a particular state's action pair. We know the original definition of the state's action value or so-called Q value is the total expected discounted reward starting from these particular states initially and we uh, action A at the first step and then the following policy pi for subsequent actions. By this definition, we can simulate the one or maybe multiple trajectories under this policy pi uh, for, uh, from this particular state action pair and use the empirical uh, mean return as an estimate for the Q value. So this is just the original definition. We also know that the Q function satisfies the so-called Bellman equation. Now, suppose that we have an access to an estimate Q function, uh, I denote by QO here. Now, given just a single step transition from the staged action pair, we can update our estimates as the sum of the immediate reward and the discounted uh, old estimate Q value for the next staged action pair. Here, we bootstrap from an, the existing uh, estimate Q old, and it serves as an estimate of the remaining term in the summation in the first definition. And actually, uh, many algorithms, like value iteration, Q learning are, are based on this idea. And these two definitions, or these two ideas, actually are, to me, I think they are basis of reinforcement learning most methods they used a combination of these two ideas. Uh, in this talk, I will focus on Monte Carlo methods. Uh, that's the involves a significant component of simulation. So it's closed us to the first method here. And the one example is used to multi-step look ahead instead of single steps look ahead from the Bellman equation. Uh, many well-known reinforcement learning algorithms are primarily based on Bellman equation, including the TD learning, Q learning, fitted value iteration. Uh, they are very popular and have been studied extensively. And here I will focus on understanding the Monte Carlo method, which is also powerful. Uh, hopefully I, I can convince you uh, this at the end of my talk. In particular, uh, Monte Carlo methods takes the advantage of simulators, which can be available for many applications. And for some application domain, they might have abundant real world data that can be utilized to build an approximation to a simulation model. And as we saw in the previous slide from the Monte Carlo uh, simulation, we can just focus on the value of policy locally at a single state. We are particularly interested without solving the entire MDP. So the complexity actually does not scale to the state space. And a result here is we can do the decision time planning, meaning uh, we can do planning just on the state, just for the state we encountered in real time. And also, it's more robust when the environment is not truly Markovian. 
and applications that benefit for, uh, from MC methods include games like Go and the video games. And the application that I'm particularly interested in is queuing network control for resource allocation problems. Uh, here, usually it's easy to simulate either from an artificial simulator or a synthetic simulator built from real world data. And also the state-based or queuing system are typically unbounded. And the local property of MC method make it the well suited for such a learning task when a new state is encountered in real time. And also we can still use the MP method when the arrival and the service are not microbial. And having said that, of course, I, I should mention that, uh, that applications like clinic codes to treatments for which uh, Monte Carlo methods are less appropriate. Since typically a simulator is not available and the data is very expensive and difficult to obtain. Uh, with this background in mind, uh, I, today I will talk about two of my work related to uh, Monte Carlo methods. I will first focus on Monte Carlo research, one of the most popular and empirical successful uh, um, uh, MC methods. Uh, for the second part, I will focus on data-driven queuing network control. I will talk about how to achieve stability by using MC methods. And if I have time, I will briefly talk about how to achieve the optimality given a stable policy. So uh, that's starts with uh, Monte Carlo's research, uh, a, frame, a search framework for finding optimal decisions. Uh, actually, there are many variants of MCTS. Uh, today, we will focus on the most popular one called uh, upper confidence to bound for tree or UCT. Uh, it has been used in many applications, uh, such as AlphaGo and AlphaGo Zero. However, uh, despite of its popularity, uh, its rigorous performance guarantee is not so clear. This is the one I'm going to talk about today. Uh, to set up, uh, assumes that we have access to a simulator. So we can sample trajectories. Now, suppose that we are constantly at state ST. It might be a very important state that we don't want to screw up. And now your job here is to find a good action for just for this state ST. And MCTS, is a method for solving this problem. It will take the current state as the input, and it will output a recommendation for the actions that we can we should take for, and then we will make a maybe make a transition to the next state. Uh, at a high level, so uh, I think MCTS combines the ideas of simulation, uh, multi-step look ahead, and the smart sampling. Uh, to be a little bit more specific, we will imagine what might happen starting the phone now in the short term to the future by simulating multiple trajectories from the constant state ST. And moreover, we will learn adaptively from this imaginary experience. So we can allocate the future simulations towards the more promising trajectory in order to give uh, obtain a very good action that we should take for the constant state. And in my opinion, I think the most important ingredient for MCTS is the smart sampling. It is the, what makes the MCTS the more powerful than naive the Monte Carlo method, but also it makes the analysis quite challenging uh, as we will see later. Okay, so this is the brief overview. Uh, now, let me illustrate the details of MCTS. Uh, just for simplicity, here assumes that there are only two actions, A1 and A2. And the transition here is deterministic. Uh, we can easily generalize to stochastic transition setting. Now, the tree here 
represents all the possible trajectories of the MDP, starting from the current state as T and up to H stacks. And this is an example of a tree with five stacks. And each node on the tree here represents a state. Uh, the root node here is the current ST uh, that we are interested. And each edge corresponds to an action. From the current state ST, action A1 leads to state S1, and action A2 leads to state S2, and so on. Uh, I want to point out here if this is an imaginary tree. Uh, that's why I put dash line here. Uh, in practice, MCTS starts with an empty tree only with the root node. And it will build this tree gradually from the state actions they encounter during simulation. Uh, in particular, uh, we will simulate multiple trajectories up to edge steps and always starting from the root node, the, the constant state ST. For example, the first simulation is this trajectory, uh, which is a sequence of states to action, reward, the next days, next action, re next reward, uh, next days, et cetera, and up to the leaf node here. And for the leaf node, if we have access to an estimate the value function, say v hat, then we can use this to uh, represent the, our estimation of the future reward starting from the leaf node. And if we don't, then we can simply just assign the value zero as an estimate for the leaf node. And now we, the trajectory information, the action sequence, uh, states the reward sequence, we are going to update uh, or keep an estimate of Q value for every state action pair on the, on the trajectory. So for example, for the state action pair here, the estimate is going to be the return of this trajectory starting from this uh, pair and up to this end, like what we have seen previously for Monte Carlo simulation. Okay, so this is just one uh, simulation and say the second trajectory is here. And similarly, we are going to update the Q value for the state uh, action pair we encountered in the, uh, in the simulation. And now for these state action pair, we are going to update its Q value as the mean of the returns from these to the uh, red trajectory and the green trajectory. And we, we continue to run simulation and might have some other trajectory. And similarly, we do the update. And when we finish it, we end simulation. So there are end trajectories uh, that's to overlay from a tree. We obtain an estimate Q value for, or outputs the estimate Q value for the root node. Now, with this estimate Q value, we can obtain or uh, a suggested policy or suggested action for the state we are interested in, the root node. Uh, the policy can be a greedy with respect to our Q value estimates, or it can be a softmax with a temperature tau, a parameter tau. And the action AT here will be the, the action we are going to take for the, the current state ST. So this is the idea of the MCTS. And so far, so good. But wait, one thing I haven't told you yet is how do we choose the, these trajectories of starting the, from the uh, root node? Or how we choose the simulation at each iteration? And maybe more specifically, which actions should we choose or which edge should we choose at each iteration, at each stage? during a simulation. And the policy that's the specified the decision here is corresponding to so-called tree policy. Okay, can I ask, uh, jump in? Yeah. Also during these, um, you're sort of visiting different nodes in this tree repeatedly during this process. Do you have some way of updating like the Q values at each of these nodes? Is there some methodology for 
updating the Q value based on the experience that you gain? Uh, so if I understand your question, you mean uh, we might, we can visit the different states action pair doing the simulation. Yeah. And for each state action pair, we are maintained the Q value estimate. Right. And, and does that estimate change as you go through this process? And so you have some you have some methodology for updating that estimate as exactly. you go along. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So one way can be just simple average of the from the trajectory right. you obtained so far. Right, that makes sense. Yeah, and now we will see exactly why we are need to uh, maintain such an estimate. Okay, so uh, come back to the tree policy here. Uh, the simplest policy you can think about is just to choose your action uniformly randomly. Okay, uh, so this is the very simple and it's corresponding to so-called sparse sampling started almost 20 years ago. Uh, MCTS use something uh, smart or uh, more adaptive way. Right? So here we borrow ideas from banded literature and the trees, the decision at each stage or each node on the tree as the multi-arm banded problem. We know in uh, to choose a crux, uh, to choose an action here, we can use a classical banded algorithm called uh, upper confidence bound. And we cause that for each state action pair uh, or each edge here, we keep an estimated Q value, which is just the empirical mean of prior uh, trajectory returns. And according to UCB, we will choose an action that maximizes the sum of the empirical value and a bonus term. And typically the bonus term encourage exploration for actions that have not been visited often so far. And we know in uh, MAB, the standard choice of the bonus term is logarithmic in T. So here T denote the total number of visits for uh, the state so far. And the, this choice, particular choice here, comes from often concentration in quality for IID rewards. However, it turns out that for MCTS with a tree structure, we need to use a bonus term that is the polynomial in T rather than logarithmic. And this is actually very crucial. Uh, I will come back to these points later. So now say we use the polynomial bonus term, then we can establish the following the performance guarantee for MCTS. Suppose that at each simulation, we we'll use an old estimate that we have for the leaf node, uh, which is the if strong accuracy. And if we run n trajectory or n simulations, each up to h steps, and then the output to estimate Q value for the loose node satisfies the foreign error bound. Uh, the error bound here uh, have two parts. The first pass is due to the error at the leaf node. And the second pass comes from finite simulations. So if we have, if the number of simulation n is sufficiently large, then the first term will dominate. And recall that the gamma here is the discounted factor, which is between zero and one. So this term is always the smaller than the accuracy if strong of the old estimate. So in this sense, MCTS improved the estimates for the loose node over the uh, old estimates that we had out. And note that our results here is useful even if we don't have an estimate for the leaf node. For example, we can simply plug in the value zero for the V hat out here. And if the reward is bounded, then the error if strong for the leaf node will satisfy this trivial upper bound. Okay, so this is the results, uh, the guarantees for MCTS if we use the polynomial bonus. Term. Uh, any questions that before I uh, briefly discuss the proof ideas?
Okay, uh, if not, uh, let me continue. The key challenge of approving the previous theorem uh, comes from the dependency and the non-stationarity. Uh, both arrives due to the tree structure of MCTS. Uh, in particular, you can imagine MCTS is a hierarchy of the MABs, which means each arm itself is an MAB. Just, just for example here, consider the MAB at a loose node. Now, the left arm itself is an MAB with two sub-arms. And the return sequence for the left arm here depends on which arm we selected at a lower level. And it creates a lot of dependency across different layers and also across the random returns for the upper layer. And moreover, we know the subarm is selected adaptively. So since the bonus term keep changing over time. So the return sequence for the upper level for each arm is non-stationary. And with this dependency and the non-stationarity, the return sequence for each arm on the tree, of course, except the uh, leaf node here, then no longer ID and does not satisfy the classical Hopkins exponential concentration. And this is exactly why the original UCT with the log, uh, log bonus term is not guaranteed to work in general. And the original UCT paper claims as in particle convergence to UCT, but the proof is actually incomplete. Uh, the key idea of our proof is to use the induction with respect to the tree depth. Uh, in particular, our induction hypothesis is follows. Uh, for each arm, the empirical average of the return uh, concentrates around its limiting expectation. And in particular, the tail bound is polynomial rather than the conventional the exponential concentration. And these property can hold for all layers if we used a polynomial bonus term for our action selection. And I want to emphasize that the parameters for the concentration vary across different layers uh, due to the dependency properties uh, I mentioned earlier. And an interesting fact here is AlphaGo zero also used a similar polynomial bonus term. And we can easily, uh, we can generalize our results and analysis to uh, two player zero sum game. That's alpha goes zero try to solve in general. Okay, uh, so this is basically I want to talk about for the MCTS. Uh, before I move on to extensions, uh, I will pause here in case there are any questions. Yeah, I just, uh, I had a question about uh, N and T if you, in the, the bonus bound term on the previous slide. So, I mean, could there be situations where uh, N is smaller than the square root of T? Uh, no, so uh, recall that T, is, so just for simplicity for the loose note here, T is the total number of uh, visits to this day so far. And N is the number of actions, uh, number of times we play this particular action. Mm -hmm. So N is always smaller than T. Right. Yeah. I mean, so N is always smaller than T. Could it be smaller than the square root of T for a really wide tree or something? I'm not sure if my question is. Uh, I mean, because I, I guess I'm just saying like, that bonus term could be growing with, you know, over time then, like getting bigger and bigger and bigger, not smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, well, that's an interesting question. Uh, I, I don't have a rigorous answer to this question, but I think uh, this might not happen uh -huh. in, intuitively. Uh, yeah. yeah, I guess I'm just wondering like how wide the tree is and how that all interacts. Uh, I mean, if the tree isn't, you know, too wide or deep, I guess it's not not going to happen. But I wasn't sure about a really wide or tree if that could be somehow 
Yeah, because we kind of want that bonus turn to 10 to zero, right? Uh, with the sufficient number of visits, the eventually yeah. it will decrease. Yeah, yeah, decrease to zero. Yeah, but both T and N are kind of growing, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. Okay, well, maybe we can chat about that afterwards. That's, that's interesting though. I, I get the idea though about the polynomial concentration, which is also okay. interesting, so thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to talk more offline. Okay, uh, any other questions? Uh, if not, uh, let me continue. Uh, I will briefly talk about some extensions here. So, so far uh, we have seen that for a query or for a query state, the MCTS can output an improved estimate or a high quality estimate. And you can imagine we can do this for finite many states, say M states. Now we can generalize these improvements or these estimates to other unseen states when maybe the state space is huge or maybe continuous. And indeed we can do this by formulating as the regression problem. So here we want to predict the value for states and we are given uh, M training data. Uh, here SI is the feature and the V has is the label or the response. And you can use your favorite the supervised learning algorithm uh, AlphaGo Zero use deep neural network. And you can also use the non-parametric regression, such as nearest neighbor. And moreover, we can do this iteratively in the following way. So MCTS will generate the high quality training data and supervised learning will generalize these estimates to the entire state space. And then we can in turn use the output of supervised learning as the leaf node estimate for MCTS to guide our simulation, uh, which will further generate the new input training data and continues. So together, MCTS with supervised learning served as the strong policy improvements operator here. Uh, so this is the one uh, generalization. And the all the results I talked about so far assumes the finite action space. And recently, we generalized MCTS to continuous action uh, space setting. Now, each node on a tree, instead of a finite arm uh, bandit, it becomes a continuous arm bandit. And we combine the MCTS with adaptive discretization of the, state, uh, of the action space. And again, using polynomial consent, uh, confidence bound is crucial here and we can obtain similar convergence guarantee. Uh, we evaluate our approach on several benchmarks from OpenAI Gene. Uh, our approach, the last line here, e uh, match or improve several existing algorithms. So here we mainly compiled with the tree search algorithms. So we can see for the challenging lunar lander problem, uh, our approach achieves the much better performance. Okay, uh, so this is basically what I want to talk about for MCTS. Uh, in the second part, I will focus on reinforcement learning for tuning network control. Uh, let me start with a very simple tuning example for scheduling problems. Uh, here it has a single server and the two buffers. Uh, jobs arrive to be processed by the server and typically, these buffers are modeled as infinite size. And the server here have limited capacity, so it can serve the one job at a single time. And for this system, we can describe the state by the vector of the Q-lens. So the state space is unbounded here. And in the language of the, uh, reinforcement learning, the action here is the scheduling decision for the server about which queues to serve. And uh, usually a common metric here is to minimize the average total queue lens. Or equivalently means that we try to minimize the delays for the incoming jobs. Uh, this is just a very simple example. Uh, that can be, uh, the tree network can be more complicated or general for other resource allocation problems. 
there might be a parallel servers here and with different service rates. And sometimes there can be constraints on which queues can be scheduled simultaneously. For examples, including the wireless communication. Or maybe we need to do the loading decision for the incoming jobs to do load balancing. And now what we are interested in here is learning optimal policies purely from data without knowing the system's dynamics, without knowing the arrival, we don't know the service. And reinforcement learning is the suitable framework for such a learning task. And of course, using reinforcement learning has its own challenges. Uh, as I mentioned, a key feature of many twin systems is the unbounded state space. So if you use traditional offline training and then deploy the approach, it might not work. Uh, say the blue region here represents all the states that's visited during the training phase. And in a queuing system with randomness, we will visit some states not observed in the training phase, say a yellow state here, which can be far away from the training data. So the previously trained policy might not behave well here. For example, it might keep serving an empty queue while the other queue has many, many jobs waiting there. So decision planning is necessary. And what I mean here is we want the algorithm to have the ability to learn a good action. And when we encounter a new stage in real time. Uh, also, uh, due to the unbounded state space, uh, minimizing the currents or finding the optimal policy is very challenging. And even keeping the currents finalized is highly non-trivial. So that's the first to consider the simpler problem of maintaining the currents finite, which means that we try to stabilize the system. And we know stability is the necessary first step towards the optimality. Uh, in particular, here we can see a notion of stability that is appropriate for reinforcement learning. So you don't need to look at the exact mask here. So the condition or the definition can be actually illustrated by the figure here. So we call a policy sequence to stable if the underlying system satisfies two conditions. The first one is boundedness, which means that for most of the time, the system will stay in a bounded region. And for the second one, say, uh, if occasionally the system visits some state, uh, the yellow state outside a bounded region, then the system has the ability to recover from such undesirable state and returns to the bounded region within the finite time step. And you might notice the definition here is similar to the standard definition of positive recurrence for time homogeneous Damarco chain. Uh, one key difference here is we allow the policy sequence to be non-stationary because in reinforcement learning, typically we are going to update the policy and improve the policy over time. So the underlying Markov chain can be time inhomogeneous. Now, the questions we asked here is for such unbounded state space, how can we learn a stable policy purely from data? And our idea is based on a Monte Carlo search method. Uh, overall, the algorithm works as follows. For each time step, uh, we are going to first query a Monte Carlo map oracle for the current state and get a distribution of actions as the suggested policy for the current state here. And then we follow the suggestion and take an action according to the distribution and the system transitions to the next state. And we can repeat this process for the subsequent the states and taking subsequent actions and continue. Uh, the overall procedure is simple. Now, our hope here is the outputs from these MC oracles 
uh, are close to the optimal policy in some sense. Then if the system is stable under the optimal policy, then we might be able to claim stability of the approximated policy sequence generated from the MC oracle. And moreover, we hope that for each query uh, for this oracle, we can compute such an approximate policy by only using finite samples. And the natural question here is how, what kind of methods we can use for these MC uh, oracles here. Uh, there are a couple of uh, traces here. Uh, one is the sparse sampling I mentioned earlier. And the other one is MCTS I just talked about. Now, record blast for MCTS, we proper parameters, the estimate Q value for the query state uh, can be close to the optimal Q value with high probability. So if we construct a softmax policy from the estimate Q value, where parameter, temperature parameter tau here, then we can bound its distance from the optimal policy for these query states. Here in particular, the arrow bound here can be made arbitrary small. As long as we have the small arrow bounds for the Q value estimate and choose the temperature parameter tau properly. And of course, a natural question here is how small uh, this arrow bound should be in order to achieve stability. And what's the correspond uh, corresponding sample complexity per time step? And to answer these questions, uh, I need to introduce the assumption here. In particular, in order to have hope for achieving stability, the optimal policy itself must be stable, which means the optimal policy leads to a positive recurrence to Markov chain. And we know in queuing system, this typically means the system load is within the capacity boundary. And on the other hand, it is well known that positive recurrence is equivalent to the existence of so-called the Abelon function. And this motivates us to assume that the Markov chain under the optimal policy satisfies uh, the optimal drift condition. Uh, more specifically, we assume that the, the Abelon function uh, have all the possible change during any transition is bounded by some constants. And for each state, such as the Abelon function is above some threshold, we'll have a negative to drift to minus r. Uh, such a Diapole function uh, indeed exists for many queuing systems. For a single server example, uh, we seen earlier, a linear function uh, served as a valid Diapole function satisfies these assumptions. And I just want to emphasize that our algorithm does not need to know the exact the Apollon function. And under this uh, assumption, and we proper guarantees from the MC Oracle, our algorithm indeed outputs a stable policy sequence. So let me remind you here, uh, if strong corresponding to the Q function error from the MC Oracle, and the tau is the temperature parameter for the softmax, and alpha is the minus alpha is the negative drift for the Apollon function. So basically the theorem says, as long as the error bound for the Q function is small enough, then the policy sequence is stable. And moreover, the sample complexity per time step is finite. In particular, it scales with the drift parameter as follows. And I, I mentioned that our algorithm does not need to know the exact the Apollon function. Uh, but uh, our parameter indeed depends on the drift parameter, as you can see from the results here, which is unknown a priori. So to tackle this issue, uh, we developed a 
adapted version of our algorithm that can automatically discover a, a proper parameter for the algorithm. And the key idea is to construct a statistical hypothesis testing for whether or not the Q lens is growing. And also, uh, the results for a sample complexity uh, from the previous slide is super polynomial in one over alpha. It means that it can become highly efficient when the parameter, the drift parameter is small. And we know in the context of queuing systems, typically a small drift parameter alpha corresponding to the high load regime, which is often the regimes of particular interest for us to obtain the insight of the system performance. So we have the refined version that can improve the sample complexity from super polynomial to polynomial. And here D is the dimension of the state space. So this is basically what I want to talk about for stable reinforcement learning for the queuing system. Uh, Jack, how many minutes do I have? You have uh, about seven minutes, but maybe we want to have some questions too, so. Okay, uh, I think I will quickly wrap up here. Uh, so uh, I would just briefly talk about how we can achieve stable uh, optimality. And given that, we can have a stable policy. And the high level idea of approach is to divide the state space into two parts, uh, bounded subset and all states outside. And for all states outside here, we are going to apply a default to stable policy. It can be some policy you already know, or we can use our stable reinforcement learning policy. And the key intuition here is under stable policy, the system will visit these red states only with small probability. So the associated cost for these red states can be small. And now for the bounded subset here, we will apply a model-based reinforcement learning to learn the optimal policy. And say we truncate the state space to add a parameter u, and similarly under some assumptions to only upper function, the average Q length of our algorithm actually approach the optimal average Q length, the low star, and the gap actually decays exponentially in the truncation planet. Uh, so let me show you some simulation results here. Let's consider the scheduling problem with stochastic connectivity. Here at each time slot, QI is connected to the server with some probability CI. So this model can actually be used to model the communication uh, wireless communication. And finding the optimal policy here actually remain uh, an open problem for over 20 years. Now, for our approach, uh, we used uh, the serve longest queue, connected queue, as the default stable policy. And say we truncate the queue length at five. Now, the average queue length of our algorithm, uh, the red line here, converge to the value of 3.9 which is better than the default the stable policy, the blue line here. And if we increase the truncation parameter to 10, then we can obtain a better uh, Q length, which is 3.7. And we have similar results for load balancing and the switch scattering problem as well. Uh, before I end my talk here, I just want to share some of my thoughts on reinforcement learning methods for queuing network control. Uh, some recent empirical work uh, shows the promising and exciting performance of RL-based approach for challenging queuing network from, uh, problems. Uh, for instance, for switch scattering that's uh, used to model uh, uh, data, uh, uh, data transfer in data center and also in wireless communication. Uh, for this problem, we tried uh, Monte Carlo tree search with function approximation, the blue line here, and it outperforms the well-known max weight matching algorithm and achieves comparable performance with currently best known policy, the max weight with a parameter, alpha. 
And some, some other recent work uh, also shows a promising performance uh, by using policy optimization and combined with neural network to achieve the better performance to, uh, compared with existing uh, heuristics. And I believe reinforcement learning has the potential of finding better policies. And it can also serve as performance the benchmark. And I believe the reinforcement learning also has the potential for our every, uh, operation research applications. Uh, with my colleague, Christina Lee and the seat manager at Cornell here, we are currently developing a toolkit for reinforcement learning algorithms, targeting for operation research applications. You can think of it as an OR version of the OpenAIG. But instead of robotics to control, we aim to provide a reinforcement learning benchmark for OR domain, such as ride sharing, uh, ambulance routing, revenue management, and inventory control. And please let me know if you think some other operational research application that could benefit from reinforcement learning, and we can make the list longer. Uh, let me Right after we a brief overview of my research agenda here, uh, my work has been mainly motivated by applications in computer and network systems. And I'm also interested in our application domain, particularly all our applications. And I have primarily taken a model driven approach for stochastic systems, focusing on performance to modeling and analysis. And I will continue working on important problem in this area. And my work on reinforcement learning focused on general methodology with a goal of building theoretical foundation for real world applications. And the work I talk about here today explored our based methods for stochastic systems. And in addition to the results that I talk here, I'm currently also working on more sophisticated approach using policy optimization and function approximation, and also exploiting structure of the network. Uh, a long-term goal of, of my research is to bridge model -based, a model-driven and the data-driven approach. For example, I, I believe the stochastic models can be utilized to guide the design of our algorithms, such as the choice of function approximation. And conversely, we can utilize the reinforcement learning to provide insight for designing simpler and robust algorithm. And of course, there are still many challenges ahead that we need to tackle before we can make it more practical and insightful. And there are many exciting problems here I would like to work. Uh, let me stop here. And that's all I want to talk about here today. Thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Jiaomin. That was uh, a lot of great work uh, that you shared with us and a, and a nice vision. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? You can unmute yourself if you have one or in the chat. Otherwise, I'm, I maybe have a, sort of a, a forward looking question, but I will. Um, can I go ahead, Jack? Of course. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, Jiaomin, thank you for your great talk. I have a quick question. So, for the Queen case, I, I, I wasn't very sure because you have a simulator for simulating the queuing system, and and then and then you are trying to uh, learn the policy using the MTTS method. So so it doesn't seem to be like a, like like realistic use use case. Um, but do you have any idea? Because like you seem to know that all these news and lambda source queuing parameters, and there's no reason to learn learn a new policy using RL, that's my understanding. So do you have any other use cases like where like you have some simulator? I don't know, I guess. So the reason why I'm like kind of confused about this is like, you think about like the Go playing Go, like we know how the exact dynamics is, but we don't know what is a good policy. But for the queuing systems, if you know the underlying behaviors, underlying parameters, we know the optimal policy, like max rate, back pressure, this kind of thing. So, just curious why like um, you are looking into this kind of, and whether, whether there are any realistic use cases like this for that. Uh, that's an excellent question. So your question is, well, it seems like unrealistic to use simulator for queuing systems. 
so for this question, uh, the answer here is for twin systems, uh, sometimes we do have a simulator. And actually what I mean here is we can actually build a, approximate the simulator for real world trace. So at the beginning, I actually, uh, so currently there are many public trace available for both the wireless communication and some uh, data centers the operations as well. So the hope here is we can build approximates the simulator. And so this is one. And the second one here, is, as I mentioned, for many twin systems, the optimal policy is unknown. And we know we how to use the max waste or back projects to make the system stable, but it, we still far away to, from the optimal policy. And the reasons the results that we currently are also working on is how we can utilize the power of reinforcement learning to guide to give us the, some sense or some insight. What's really the best policy? What's the optimal policy? Or what kind? So these will will be more, uh, more work I would like to work in the future. So it's impossible to maintain a giant table or use the MCTS for every single state. And now the hope here is, can we post analyze the behavior or the policy generated from this reinforcement learning paradigm? And these insights can give us to some knowledge about the system. So what is the good policy? And can we, usually, can we use a simple representation rule to present the policy instead of maintaining a huge neural network or a huge table? Yeah. Right, that makes sense. I have a quick follow-up question. So let's say, um, let's say the only unknown things we have in our system is the, is the model parameters. Let's say we know the, um, how the exact cues are working, but Let's say I always, the only thing I don't know is are like, let's say mu's or lambdas, those kinds of parameters. So for those cases, uh, I think people used to do like robot scheduling where they learn the like mu's and lambda while doing max weight and they show that they are to converge well. So do you have any like sample complexity comparison between those kinds of policies for, for the cases we know what the optimal policy looks like? Uh, so, okay, uh, a few comments here. Uh, first, for many twin system, uh, max waste type algorithm is not too stable. So uh, only for very simple systems, we know the exact optimal policy. And indeed, uh, some approach try to explore, uh, try to learn the parameter, the model parameters, and then apply to our domain knowledge or algorithm we already. Know. So you can think about this is more like a model-based reinforcement learning, or not exactly reinforcement learning, but learn the parameter from the data and then apply to the policy we already know that can work well. Uh, so the second comment here is the model you, we talk about is kind of like stationary. You assume the arrival is fixed there, you assume the survey is uh, fixed there. But in reality, in particular in data centers, the traffic actually keep changing over time. And the policy, you, uh, the parameter you, you, uh, you estimate country might not be the true parameter you, you will experience at the next time step. So ideally, or the eventual goal of this learning-based approach is how perhaps we can learn a policy automatically adjust to the environment. And we lost the specifying the, the exactly underlying the model. I see. And I'm pretty sure like the, uh, the old robust policies used to have also adaptivity like uh, as the mu and lambda could be time bearing, but I'm pretty sure that like cannot go beyond like the simple like queuing settings we have. So I, I fully agree with you that. Okay, that sounds very interesting. Thanks. Okay, one last quick question. Thanks, Lakeng. We'll put Yingluang had his hand up for a while. So Yingluang, do you want to ask your question real quick? Sure, thanks. Uh, this is a great talk. Can I ask uh, like, how do you use induction to Build like confidence bound for Monte Carlo tree search. Or do you like uh, start your induction from top from the root node to the leaf node or the other way? Uh, the other way. So you start the induction from the leaf node. Uh, then do you uh, move up, yeah, move in the reverse direction. So uh, in, in that way, is, is that fair to say like 
uh, the number of samples required is still surface like at least two to the power of depth. I mean, if it's a binary tree. So still yes. is still like some large constant like uh, proportional to two to the power of depth that will hide in your regret analysis or whatever. Is that fair to yeah, say that? that? That's an excellent observation. So in the result, I only put the big O there. Uh, mm -hmm. Indeed, we uh, I omitted all the dependence on the depth and the number of actions. And I see. In, in, in the worst case, it is true, it will have the uh, two to the power of H, H is the depth here. Mm -hmm. And actually, so indeed some recent work show uh, this is the, so this is the worst case we can get. And if you don't impose any additional assumption, it is a hard instance. And the, the, the so there's no much you can do to improve the complexity. But sure. some recent work indeed shows that uh, MCTS can have a better performance in terms of instance the based or instant dependence the bound. So see. for some instance that is easier, you might stop the earlier on the tree instead of exploring all the paths on the tree. And then but for some case, it's the difficult case. Yeah. Sure. Uh, can I also ask a very quick yeah. another question? So uh, I noticed that you use HOO in your uh, to do discretization for your continuous Monte Carlo tree search. Yes. And I wonder, is there a particular reason for you to choose HOO rather than some more like recent work like SOO or even SQL? Because I remember HOO requires to know some smoothness parameter in order to do the discretization to do the uh, discretization. Well, some recent works that doesn't require that assumption. So I wonder if you can generalize your your, your approach to those uh, uh, discretization that's an, approaches. That's an excellent suggestion and the question. Uh, so at that time, we mainly focused on HOO uh, as the primary used in other three search methods as well. So as the starting points, we consider HOO and analyze its performance. And I think it will be very interesting to see where SOO can be integrated with MCTS as well. Yeah, that's an interesting question I can think about. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank All you. All right, thanks, Yiglun. So let's everyone thank, uh, thank our speaker for a wonderful, wonderful talk again. And Xiaomin, we're gonna maybe, so some of the faculty may uh, if, want to hang around for just a little bit. Maybe you can, uh, Everybody take like a, like let's take a two minute break. So uh, just sort of everybody, if you need, so if you need to like take a nature break or get some more tea or water or anything. Yeah, let me, let okay. me get some tea. Okay, and then we'll be back in just in, in two minutes. So like, thank, thanks to the students for coming. Faculty who wanna hang out and just get to know Chiaomin a little bit, uh, come on back in two minutes.